Well, hello, hello. Uh, welcome to Monday. Um, let me tell you what our plan is for today. Plans have been known to go awry, but here's what our plan is. Uh, we have a really exciting first segment, uh, which I will explain in just a second. The second segment is tied somewhat to the fact that over the weekend, I became aware of the fact that I am, I've become Bloomberg curious. Um, it's all, that's all it is right now. It's a, you know, it could be a phase I'm going through. You know, it could be just a time of my life where I'm more curious about what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I am I am Bloomberg curious, and I'll, I just discovered over the weekend a lot of other people are too. They it, it is a little bit analogous, I think, to a, a thing I saw on Twitter where you know we watched all the debates uh, and we've scrutinized all the candidates, and it's sort of like being at a restaurant and you've looked at the whole menu and you say to the waitress or waiter, "Are there any specials?" <laughs> <laughs> There's really nothing that really, you know. Anyway, uh, it may be a little bit of that, but we're going to talk to Mike Pesca about what it means to be Bloomberg curious. He uh, has direct experience of Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, and then I hope we'll have time on the other side of that to take your calls, too. Not just about being Bloomberg curious, but, you know, kind of how this whole democratic field is beginning to line up for you. All right. So, but let's get to uh, the meat uh, of this first segment, uh, a very fascinating article by McKay Coppins, our guest, a staff writer at The Atlantic and the author of The Wilderness, Deep Inside the Republican Party's Combative, Contentious, Chaotic Quest to Take Back the White House. So uh, over the weekend, I wrote a column that, or I published a column that um, for the most part, uh, supporters of Donald Trump did not like and opponents of Donald Trump did like. Uh, and I heard from both groups. And it is kind of interesting when you're hearing from pretty strong Trump supporters because they use some of the same phrases that are not common and they bring up certain things that you wouldn't think they would necessarily know about or things that, for example, they're way more interested in the uh, harm being caused by Maxine Waters. Like on most days, I don't think about Maxine Waters. But for some reason or other, they are thinking a lot about Maxine Waters and about the terrible things that she does. And she just doesn't loom that large over the political landscape for me. So, and like, like they know this whole Cole Kofer Black to Mitt Romney Burisma connection. And, and so some of that is they're watching Fox News, and I don't watch that much Fox News. But we also know that there are these other pipelines of information that exist mostly underground, underground meaning with somewhere in social media where they are delivered directly to a subset of information consumers. And these, this information isn't vetted very much or at all. It may be intentionally deceptive. It may be propagandistic. And it is invisible to most of, it, of us. It's invisible to everybody except the small group of people for whom it is intended. So this is what uh, McKay Coppins has been writing about. And McKay Coppins, you, you undertook to study this in a very, I think, smart and direct way, which is you kind of became on social media a kind of person who might be a likely recipient of this kind of information. Tell us how you did that. Yeah, that's right. So one, one day last fall, it was during, it was right around the time the impeachment proceedings were beginning, I created a separate Facebook account from the one that I normally use and kind of just made up a name, took a profile picture uh, with my face obscured. And then I started clicking like on the official pages for Donald Trump and his reelection campaign, basically signaling to Facebook that I was open to or interested in pro-Trump content. So from there, Facebook uh, suggested that I follow pages like Ann Coulter, the conservative pundit, Fox Business, variety of fan pages with names like In Trump We Trust. Um, and, I, and I did that. And so basically what I did was created a Trumpified news feed on my, Facebook, uh, on my Facebook account where every day I could scroll through and see what kind of information the president and his allies were pumping out uh, for their supporters. And And you kind of noticed that this almost had us, you know, you were very conscious of what you were seeing, but it also kind of had a kind of background radiation effect on you a little bit. I mean, you were, in fact, hearing narratives that you hadn't previously heard. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I did not expect to glean that much from this exercise, honestly. Like when I started out, I thought, you know, maybe it'll be a good way to keep an eye on the on some of the more outlandish things that the campaign uh, puts out. 
but I, I clearly didn't think it would affect me just because I'm, you know, a, a journalist and I think I have a fairly high media literacy and I, I'm my job is to deal with the facts of the daily political news. What I found, though, was that over time, uh, it, it did kind of take a toll. I, you know, I found myself almost reflexively becoming suspicious of every headline that I encountered, whether it was from a pro-Trump page or even a trusted news outlet. And, and it wasn't that I believed tr President Trump and his, and his allies were telling the truth. It was more that I had become so cynical and suspicious that it, that it was almost impossible, it felt impossible to locate the truth. I, I, it was like observable reality itself was sort of drifting out of reach. It, it was a very strange experience for me. Right. And I, I feel as though because um, I often am uh, contacted more because of my columns than because of my radio show by Trump supporters, I, I have a similar experience. And one of the things that I notice is that it's very difficult to have a very a, a, a fact set specific conversation about one issue because what has happened and you have studied why, how this has happened. But what has happened is it isn't that they believe one false narrative about fact pattern X. It's that they believe hundreds of false right. narratives about myriad topics, which are and are not at times interconnected. I mean, in, in order to unthread this Gordian knot of stuff, uh, you'd be there all day just trying to get to the one <laughs> thing that you wanted them to see the truth about. That's right. And, and also, it, the, the other thing is that a lot of the facts that they have at their disposal are actual facts, right? It's just that they're taken out of context or that they've been sewn together in kind of a creative way to prove a narrative that is observably false if you actually look at the larger picture. Um, but, you know, I, 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 we often hear that, you know, certain Trump voters or Fox News viewers are low information voters. And, and I actually don't think that that's quite right. Um, I think another journalist, I can't take credit for this, but uh, made the comment that a lot of these people are actually certain information voters, which means that they have access to a certain set of facts. They have been exposed to an elaborate mechanism that's designed to sew those facts together in a way that validates their worldview, and uh, and that's and that's how what how why they believe what they believe. So um, one of the things that you looked at was how these facts get out, what sort of operations exist for disseminating them. Uh, I think four, four down, years down the road, we're reasonably familiar with some of the Russian operations to uh, infiltrate Facebook, uh, sometimes with fake news sites, sometimes with completely false persons who are functioning as if they were persons uh, on Facebook. But increasingly also, some of that sophistication is coming not from Russia, but from domestic politics. And a name that we quickly get to is that of Brad Parscale. So tell us a little bit about him and, and what he's doing. Yeah, Brad Parscale was a uh, kind of digital marketing guy with very little political experience when he joined the Trump campaign in 2016. He had a relationship with the Trump family uh, because he had been hired a few times to design websites for like the Trump winery or a skincare line for Melania Trump. Um, and so when Donald Trump decided to run for president, he was hired to design this website. The campaign took off, I think, unexpectedly for a lot of people involved. And Brad Parscale all of a sudden was running the digital operation for the 2016 campaign. Um, one thing that's interesting about him, and I write about this in the piece, is that he he kind of fell backwards into this job. And then the campaign almost stumbled backwards into using Facebook as a really effective tool to advance their message. You know, at the time, it's, it's kind of unbelievable now, but at the time in 2016, your average experienced political strategist thought still that the best way, the most effective way to reach voters was through television ads, through commercials. Um, the Trump campaign just didn't have enough money to compete with the Clinton campaign head-to-head -head on TV. And so uh, Brad Parscale had the idea that we should invest heavily in Facebook and Google and try to uh, get our message out that way. And so um, they, they started doing that. And, and uh, I, I ha there's a stat in my piece that is pretty remarkable. 
where toward the end of the uh, the election, there was a uh, let's see, from June to November, Trump's campaign ran 5.9 million ads on Facebook, while Clinton's ran just 66,000. So that just gives you a sense of how heavily they invested in Facebook ads and, and particularly micro-targeted Facebook ads. So when we talk about micro-targeting, and I, I confess that although I, I, I think I understand micro-targeting and I also think I understand why it should be of concern, I do wonder – and I watched the Cambridge Analytica movie and all that stuff. I do wonder if there's maybe some mythologizing that we do about it. I mean, so one of the, you know, for example, so uh, like, for example, a, a, a number that gets thrown out is, OK, so they have 3000 data points about you. And, and the implication of that is if they have 3000 data points uh, of you, constellations of those data points are predictive of your attitudes and future behavior and things that might change your mind about something. So if we know that you've got a doxy uh, and you're allergic to shellfish and you drive a Subaru Forester and blah, 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 blah. We also know that you're really worried about coronavirus. And if we were to put out a piece of news uh, that were n- was not entirely true <laughs> or was true, emphasizing what a good job candidate X is doing with coronavirus and what a bad job candidate does. B is doing, and maybe even say candidate B has investments in some pharmaceutical company which is warping his or her policy on coronavirus so that it's less effective than it needs to be, blah, 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 blah. And so then I've hit you. I've hit you right in your your ideological solar plexus. Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, so that's that's a fear we have anyway, right? That you, that you could talk to me so effectively about a specific thing that you have been able to divine through deep data about me, that my opinions and behavior would be changed, and I wouldn't even understand why. I guess, how persuaded are you that that's something that happens? Yeah, well, I think I would say that this is a matter of debate among political scientists and strategists, like how how sophisticated you can get. So Cambridge Analytica, you mentioned, their their thing was they created psychographic profiles of voters, meaning that they didn't just collect data points about, you know, who uh, or, or where they shopped or what TV shows they watched or or what news stories they were especially interested in. They they also would uh, use that data to create psychological profiles of voters and target voters with specific psychological traits that they felt they could more or less radicalize. You know, I spoke to Christopher Wiley, who worked at Cambridge Analytica, then later became uh, the, a whistleblower. And he said that essentially Cambridge Analytica was trying to seed an insurgency in the United States. Steve Bannon and uh, Robert Mercer, the two right-wing figures, were kind of in charge of it. And they were trying to use micro-targeting to coax people into ever more extreme beliefs and ideas. Now, there are political scientists who say this is all hocus-pocus, it's snake oil, you can't really do that. Um, I, I, I'm not going to come down one side or the other on that. What I do know is that micro-targeting has, been, has proven very successful with commercial advertising, and it's proven pretty successful in political advertising, even separating the kind of psychographic element and as with any tool, it can be used for good or ill, right? So I write in the, in the piece about in 2016, the Trump campaign used micro-targeting to target black voters in Florida in the final weeks of the race to try to keep them away from the polls by uh, depressing their enthusiasm for their chosen candidate, Hillary Clinton. So they used the data that they had to find black voters in Florida. They thought they could disillusion basically and ran ads that said hillary clinton thinks african americans are super predators which was seizing on a comment that clinton had made in the 90s they kind of took it out of context universalized it in a way that probably wouldn't pass muster with most fact checkers and then used that to try to depress black turnout they were not trying to win over black voters they were trying to keep them away from the polls now that we know about that specific case because a Trump campaign official ba- bragged about it at the time to a reporter saying that it was one of their voter suppression efforts. But we don't know about the vast majority of how they used micro-targeting. And given what we know about 
the president and the people in his inner circle and kind of the lines they've been willing to cross in the past, it's worth keeping an eye on how they're using micro-targeting. Right. So at the end of the 2016 election and into the the post-game analysis in, in 2017 and 2018, I mean, we started to understand that, yes, these, these kind of subversive narratives were injected into people through social media, uh, often through fake news sites, through bots, through Russian interferers. And we understood that our political dialogue or public conversation was very much polluted and compromised by it. And the rest of the world noticed, too, and freaked out about it, too. Germany started wondering, well, what's going to happen to our election? Is this going to happen, too? And everybody started looking for countermeasures. And this kind of arms race has evolved, where those of us in journalism are thinking, do we know enough about algorithms? Should we have like an algorithm desk or something that looks at and reverse engineers these things and tries to figure them out? And then opposing campaign operatives, Democrats in this case, because they clearly did get out and maneuvered, you know, they're figuring, do we up our game? Do we play that game? Do we, you know, yeah. do we go there? Or do we do stuff that shades maybe into untruth or at least is unnecessarily inflammatory just to match them missile for missile? So as you looked at all that, and that's all in this pretty comprehensive piece that I would encourage people to read after they listen to this interview, but I how does it all how does the field of battle look to you right now? Yeah, so one thing I would say l- lest this conversation come off as overly partisan, th- there are uh, information ecosystems on the left that I think are similarly toxic. Mm-hmm. They're not as big as the ones on the right. Um, and there and one key difference is that there isn't a president of the United States with an extremely well funded and technologically sophisticated sophisticated campaign that's designed to kind of amplify the narratives and pump them into this ecosystem. Um, That said, this is a problem on the left, and there are some Democratic strategists who think that they need to do more. Uh, I write in the piece about how there's a debate among Democratic strategists right now over whether they can beat the president without co-opting some of these tactics we've been talking about. And this is an open debate. You know, I, I have to say, as a journalist, my bias is obviously toward truth and accuracy and principles of uh, fairness and honesty. And it does really concern me when you hear Democratic strategists saying things like, we need to fight fire with fire or else we're never going to win. So the uh, the other stakeholders here or the other people who are able, could deliver uh, different scenarios uh, are the big social media companies. And, you know, we've seen this in the last 48 hours writ large with this uh, video that was circulated, circulated including by President Trump himself, that appeared to show Nancy Pelosi in her famous iconic act of tearing up the State of the Union address, except that it makes it look like she's doing this uh, during the introduction of Charles McGee, one of the last living Tuskegee Airmen from World War II. That would be very disrespectful. So it's a doctored altered video. The president chose to share it knowing it was a doctored altered video. And so far, it's been rather difficult to get the big social media companies to do anything about it, despite this huge call to conscience uh, that that went on in conference after conference uh, after the 2016 election results. So what can we say about Facebook and Twitter uh, and their willingness to do anything about this? Yeah, so we've seen a little bit of movement on this. You know, Twitter actually just decided not to accept political advertising because they felt that they just couldn't uh, effectively monitor it for disinformation. Um, Google has taken some measures. Facebook, though, and, and this, Facebook is really kind of most of the game here. Um, there was a key moment last fall when Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook CEO, was kind of grappling with all of this, and he came to the decision that politicians would be able to continue to run ads that contained blatant lies in them. He, he, and what he said, and, and there is a certain democratic appeal to this argument, that it shouldn't be up to us to arbitrate political speech, that you know, political speech, especially ads by politicians, receive a lot of attention and a lot of scrutiny already from journalists and watchdog groups and opposition parties, and we're just going to let them put these, this stuff out in the marketplace of ideas, and people can respond to it how they want to. That might sound good or at least reasonable, but the reality of this is that the Trump campaign has so much money and puts out so many ads 
that it's really impossible for people like me, a journalist who's covering this stuff and writing stories about it, to sort through all the stuff that they're putting out into Facebook. There, there's an archive that you can access. Anyone can access this, the Facebook ad archive. that it, They post every political ad that's published on Facebook. And if you go to Donald Trump, uh, his account, and see the ads that he's posted, there are thousands and thousands of ads. In fact, in the 10 weeks after the impeachment proceedings began, Again, the Trump campaign put out 14,000 ads containing the word impeachment. So as you can imagine, trying to sort through all of those is virtually impossible. What that means is that we have very little idea of what kinds of uh, distortions or conspiracy theories they're pumping into the bloodstream without the, our ability as journalists to kind of push back or debunk them or give them context. All right. This is a much longer conversation and a much longer article, I might add. And people should read it. It's by McKay Coppins, our guest. It's in The Atlantic. Uh, it's there online. The, it is uh, about this very process. Uh, it's called the Billion Dollar Disinformation Campaign to Reelect the President. Um, and it's a conversation we're just going to keep having because I'm interested in a lot of different elements of it. But we'll stop for now. Uh, thanks for visiting today, McKay Coppins. Thank you. And we're going to take a little break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about being Bloomberg Curious with a guy who passed beyond Bloomberg Curious. He's now Bloomberg, I don't know, Bloomberg, Bloomberg Knowledgeable, Mike Pesca. Your facts don't really count. My facts add up to what I want them to. I just say the amount. Your facts are based on science. My facts are made up on me. So this weekend, suddenly I had a th- feeling that stole across me. And so I was in the house and I turned to the other person in the house or possibly to my imaginary friend, who is not a Adolf Hitler, and said, I think I'm getting Bloomberg curious. I feel Bloomberg curious. Which is to say that, I mean, suddenly this idea of Michael Bloomberg's candidacy is very intriguing to me. And then I thought, who can I talk to about this? I can't afford expensive therapy. But I do know Mike Pesco, who's the host of the Slate Daily podcast, The Gist, uh, and the editor of the book, Upon Further Review, The Greatest What Ifs in Sports History, which has nothing to do with this conversation. And Mike has been sort of seeing around corners about Bloomberg for a while. He's way ahead of me on this, as usual. So he's here now to uh, help me uh, work on my thinking about this. So first of all, Mike, uh, welcome back to our show. Thanks. The what ifs uh, do have something to play because the entire candidacy is premised on a what if. True, true. It's what ifs. And like last time you were on, I tried to get you talking about game theory, which is very also similar. What if this? What if that? So one of the things I think that we can agree is that in terms of the actual preparation for the job of presidency, Being mayor of New York is more like being president of the United States than most things are like being president of the United States. I would say it's about a light year more like it than being mayor of South Bend, Indiana. And probably even a little more like it than being vice president of the United States. Yeah. Right. Although I just uh, was announced today that South Bend, Indiana did get a fifth traffic light and a new Piggly Wiggly. So, you know, it's more presidential all the time over there is all I'm saying. Uh, (laughs) But so, you know, I mean, Bloomberg, well, you have such a good handle on it, partly because this could devolve into the sort of ultra New Yorker contest of Bloomberg versus Bernie for the privilege of battling Trump. But I mean, (laughs) help us think about the Bloomberg piece here. I mean, uh, how should a person begin to evaluate Bloomberg's seriousness as a Democratic candidate? Right. So first of all, as a New Yorker, I consider Bloomberg to be from Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> the, here's the thing. I thought I wrote a piece for Slate saying, you know, take him seriously and probably even literally, because I just thought that the coverage of him was focused on two giant aspects of him. So uh, that's what psychologists would call anchoring. One, that he's a billionaire, and two, that he perpetuated this uh, stop and frisk policy. We can talk about stop and frisk. But if there were kind of fair profiles of Bloomberg dominating the political discourse, I would say the first or second thing would be, you know, what Mike Bloomberg did for New York, maybe Americans would like a version of that done for the country, which was 
inheriting it at a bad time, actually in quite demonstrable ways, improving the quality of life for most people, uh, some good and some bad, but making decisions that showed a lot of um, flexibility. Sometimes he would raise taxes when he needed to. Sometimes he would lower taxes when he could. It's just like this really, I think, compelling track record. If you take away his personality and how he is trying to run for president, and if you just, as a blind item said, here's 12 years of governance of 8 million people, good or bad, and would we want to take that for the country and could it map onto the country? I just think a bigger percentage of Americans would say, ooh, I'm intrigued, than the media seems to assume they'd say. So the first part of this conversation inevitably goes to, well, how much of an identifiable Democrat is Mike Bloomberg? I mean, when, when I posted on social media that I was becoming Bloomberg curious, a lot of people said, he's a Republican. I know that's not literally true, but uh, I mean, h- how much is he a reliable standard bearer of what we would think of as the Democratic Party's policies? I probably as much from the center as Bernie is from the socialist aisle. And just having lived through the Bloomberg uh, mayorality, I would say that it was quite just accepted common knowledge that the guy was a Democrat and he absolutely knew he'd be blocked from running for office as a Democrat. So he registers a Republican and gets their votes, gets in and then becomes independent. And in fact, as mayor tried to go with nonpartisan elections, which is a positive progression, a progressive election reform to take the parties out of it. Now, maybe he had a personal reason for doing so. So I guess you could say maybe I'm inflected by my own subjectivity here. But it seems to me he is very much a Democrat, sort of like wherever the mean of urban Democrats, I guess white educated urban Democrats would be. That's exactly where he is policy wise. He just changed the labels a couple times for kind of a because without doing so, we wouldn't even be talking about him except as the guy who uh, ran his uh, business. We wouldn't be talking about him as a mayor. So it seems like he did a smart thing to get elected and upon getting elected, helped uh, the people who elect him a lot and got reelected two more times. Most of those times, not as a Democrat. So one of the things we have not had the uh, opportunity to do is to see him function in in a lot of these debates. Um, obviously, he's sort of saving his his husbanding his energies for Super Tuesday. So uh, not having seen him in debates, do you have a sense of where you would put him on the current continuum? You know, with Bernie and and Warren on one side, and then whatever gradation we're going to set up through Klobuchar and Buttigieg. It's so, like where. Where's, where's Bloomberg and all that? I guess he'd be the most towards the middle of everyone who was on the stage. Although there is an argument, like if you look at where Andrew Yang is getting his support from, there's a ton of uh, Republicans or independents. But he doesn't have many policies that one would consider in any way woke. And he's the most aggressively, I guess, anti woke in terms of trying to, you know, say things or use verbiage or signal that he's anti-racist, as, you know, Ibram Kendi would would put it. But that said, I don't know practically how he's different from Amy Klobuchar. I don't know practically how he's different policy-wise from Joe Biden, except that Bloomberg's more driven by, well, does it work and can we empirically prove it? Whereas Joe Biden, at least in the early part of his career, championed a lot of policies that I think were disproved to be uh, effective policies. Bloomberg doesn't really have that, except if you want to get back to stop and frisk, which is really quite glaring. All right. Let's talk a little bit about stop and frisk. You know, one of the things that happened to me this weekend as I was lying in bed feeling this slight tingle which I initially thought might be a transient ischemia attack, but actually, no, it's actually I'm getting (laughs) Bloomberg curious. And meanwhile, I'm reading David Marchese's interview with Henry Louis Gates in The New York Times Sunday Magazine, where at a certain point, Henry Louis Gates says, I've never said this out loud before, and I don't want it to be taken as an endorsement. But with certain modifications, I can imagine Bloomberg as the guy who could go toe to toe with President Trump. And on that basis, I'm intrigued. Now, he went on to say he would have to disavow uh, and and repudiate stop and frisk at a level he has so far not done satisfactorily. And he would have to do for Henry Louis Gates's purposes the same thing about the Central Park Five. But if he could feel as though the slate were a little cleaner there. 
Henry Louis Gates is Bloomberg curious, which I find interesting. But maybe say more about the stop and frisk part of this. I would, by the way, I put Henry Louis Gates somewhere to the right or center of most of the Democrats <laughs> running, just knowing what I know about him. So stop and frisk was a policy that at its height would uh, pretty much harass upwards of half a million black and Latino, mostly black um, young men for the most part on the street. And what the benefit of that was, if you want to speak about it in amoral terms, is as this policy was going on, crime was going down and murder was going down. But, you know, I've done some of the math and it seems that for every hundred thousand stops and frisk, you'd maybe have one fewer murder. And so it wasn't uh, it wasn't a moral policy. And Bloomberg stuck with it for a long, long time. And he stuck his chin out and refused to take criticism of it. And he said, well, I'm doing it because that's what the statistics show and that's what empiricism shows. But, you know, if you run an experiment, you can't really. You can't really say that this is working. Um, it could be a bunch of confounding factors. And that's what we found out after stop and frisk was ended because a court ordered it, not because Bloomberg wanted to end it. Murder didn't spike. I mean, it went up a little under de Blasio. But again, let's also cite confounding factors. So the problem with stop and frisk was that it was, uh, you know, it's, it's an, an immoral um, imposition on many, many innocent people. And it turns those people against their government, against the idea of the, you know, the people that we vote for and democracy is working for us. It's, sure, it's really just a bad and horrible thing. But the worst thing about it was that Bloomberg, as curious as he is about policies and as willing as he is to endorse the policy, say, guess what? That's not working. Let's change it, which is to his great, great credit. That just wasn't the case on stop and frisk. He dug in. And then after he was done, he took a little bit too much pride in never having to apologize for stop and frisk. And then when he ran for mayor, he gave an apology that was, I, I think it was fine, except why did he not do it until he ran for president, you know? Um, and so I don't know how much further he can go with an apology that makes Skip Gates, I'll use the skip, <laughs> that makes Skip Gates happy. If, but by doing so, he would create this huge contrast with what he's always said. And then I think open himself up to the charges of you're just saying that because you're running for president. And that leads to a little inauthenticity. I think stop and frisk was the worst thing he did as mayor. And he did bad things. He oversaw a, uh, uh, an overtime system that was, you know, that, that uh, basically robbed the city of hundreds of millions of dollars. And he was, I don't know, he turned a little bit too much of a blind eye towards that during the Republican National Convention, in which he endorsed George W. Bush, by the way. His police were way too aggressive and arrested hundreds of protesters without cause. Um, there are definitely things in his 12 years that were bad policies. But I do think Stop and Frisk stands alone as a combination of uh, bad governance, immorality, and obstinance afterwards, a triumvirate of bad traits. Maybe just like a Saturday Night Live skit where he let Colin Kaepernick frisk him or something. You know, something to show to take the curse off here. So I, you know, another part of this, one of the many fascinating conversations I've heard uh, on The Gist was a conversation uh, between you and John Favreau, who's hosting The Wilderness these days. I thought some of your Iron Man questions were a little naive, but the, the stuff that you were talking <laughs> about, the, about these kind of micro groups of voters, right? That, you know, the, the, the for example, the Obama to Trump voters, these these kinds of groups. I mean, they're they're in play. They're of great interest. So I was sitting in a coffee shop this morning talking to my friend Danny, who's also a journalist, and I brought up being Bloomberg curious. And he said, oh, well, good luck winning an election with no black voters and no unions. <laughs> And I said, well, when you put it that way, it doesn't sound that great. But but that is generally speaking an issue, right? The, the activating groups of people who either underparticipated in 2016 or need to be brought back into the fold. So I don't know. I mean, is Bloomberg going to be able to do that with the kind of baggage we're talking about? Well, every candidate has constituencies that are gung ho for him or her and that are problems and oftentimes you know, they, they cancel out. Like if you have the young vote, oftentimes you don't have the old vote. Hello, Bernie. And the opposite with Biden. I think the unions will come along because Bloomberg will endorse policies. He'll publicly say that, you know, for instance, he'll repudiate the idea of uh, a right to work state. I mean, that alone should get every 
endorsement of every union. And by the way, he raised teacher salaries a lot. A lot of teachers don't like him, but he was pretty good with the unions in terms of uh, actually negotiating with them and paying them decently. Um, as far as black voters, again, I could see why a black voter would not be as excited about Bloomberg as a lot of the other candidates. But we do tend to a little bit overemphasize. I think this is true. I think it's true that we tend to overemphasize the importance of black vote, the black vote in the Democratic primary. And the reason I say this, you could so a, a listener could say, no, we don't. There are, uh, you know, 90 percent of black people vote for us. They're the backbone of the Democratic Party. That's all true. But ask yourself this question. What percentage of Democratic voters are African-American? And so if you say to yourself, oh, most of them or half of them, you're wildly overestimating the percentage of Democratic voters that are African-American. It's over a quarter of them. And that is significant. But I do think that in the coverage, it's it's. The implication is that black voters are about, I don't know, half or at least way more, over 40 percent of Democratic voters. And it's it's just not the case. And I also think that, you know, black voters are rational people and they know that Donald Trump is a bad and racist president. And therefore, whoever is nominated as a Democrat will get the vast majority of the black vote. You know, it seems to me, uh, we're going to wrap up here in just a second. We're talking to Mike Pesca, the host of The Gist, a daily podcast, which you should be listening to, as I do, that one of the things that you admire about Bloomberg uh, is his nimbleness, the fact that he can look at a situation and rather than seeing whether it, uh, a particular set of actions fits into his pre-stated ideology, he's, his, uh, his benchmark tends to be, does it work or does it not work? And that's pretty impressive. And I think it's also very impressive during a campaign. So prior to this conversation on the show today, we've had a conversation with McKay Coppins about his much discussed article in The Atlantic about the way information is getting fed to micro groups of voters, particularly through a, a very sophisticated Trump uh, internet apparatus. And you really do have to say, who could build a campaign that could possibly fend some of that off or counteract that or, you know, we, we already have this <laughs> this instance of Bloomberg essentially, you know, trying to buy support from Instagram influencers. Um, I mean, maybe he's the guy for that reason, too, that this is going to be a campaign where you are, you're going to have to think on your feet and you're going to have to solve problems that you currently don't know exist because they exist in some place that's very difficult to see. And, and that seems to play into Bloomberg's skill set a little bit. Yeah. I mean, what, what you're saying, I think, is the number one thing, and it's a process argument, and people aren't as enraptured by process arguments as, you know, calls to better angels of their nature and inspiration. But I just think his process is superior to everything we've seen so far. I don't think he's the Iowa caucus app of candidates. I think he's the, I mean, maybe there's a downside of this, but he's, he's the, you know, efficient algorithm Google of candidates. Um, the, number, the, the number one selling point that I always say when people are not super curious or doubt me is I talk about he came into office right after 9-11. He raised taxes 18 percent because we needed to raise taxes. Then when the economy started going well, he cut taxes consistently. And every other candidate I know always uh, campaigns on, I'm the one who raises taxes or I'm the one who lowers taxes. He's the only guy to say, well, when we need to raise it, I'll raise it. And when we need to lower it, I'll lower it. And I think 90% of voters are right there with him. You know, um, his, the way he's going to run for president will at least be smart. And it will have to be because he'll have to overcome deficits. Deficits of personality, by the way, which we haven't <laughs> even talked about. But, you know, it doesn't blow you away with uh, either the inspiration or the rhetoric or the, you know, he won't hug you or sniff your hair. So maybe that's a good thing. But yeah, he exactly what you're saying. He'll be a little bit smarter, I think, than everyone else out there. Though you could say, hey, guess what? If we don't vote for him, he'll still mobilize his smartness to help defeat Trump. Last point, um, if the idea is that there, Trump is going to have this, you know, um, um, cavalcade of, of imps and trolls and other mythological and real creatures set upon the democratic land. Well, just analogize that to the NRA. And the NRA was seen as this, you know, behemoth that could not be stopped. And Bloomberg, with his money, but also his strategy, you know, he founded an organization that is a very viable counterpoint to the NRA, which literally people say could never exist. And he made it. He breathed it into existence. So why can't he do that with the campaign? 
All right. Sounds good to me. Sounds interesting anyway. I remain Bloomberg curious. I'm going to start hanging around Bloomberg bars, seeing if I like the vibe there. Anyway, uh, Mike You're Pesca. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know that there are going to be a lot of issues about the drinking vessel itself but uh, at the bars. But anyway, uh, Mike Pesca is the host uh, of the uh, Slate Daily podcast, The Gist, and the editor of the book, Upon Further Review, The Greatest What Ifs in Sports History, which you may use to try to understand the candidacy of Mike Bloomberg. And you may enjoy yourself in the process. I certainly enjoyed talking to you. Thanks for doing this, Mike. You're welcome, Colin. All right, we're back. So before I say some thank yous and things like that, I want to say that the remainder of the show is devoted to you should you want to make a phone call to the show. Uh, and I would love to continue, if possible, this conversation, you know, as I say, not just about Michael Bloomberg, but but yes, about Michael Bloomberg. But uh, anyway, the number is 888-720-WNPR. That's 888 888- Seven two zero nine six seven seven eight 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 seven two zero WNPR. In other words, this conversation could be inflated to include a lot of different things, including your your proposition that it's disgusting to want to consider Michael Bloomberg as another billionaire who thinks he can buy an election, blah blah blah, you know. Or as Mike was just suggesting, it's disgusting to be focused on process instead of on policy. That's how we've gotten into trouble in the past. We haven't paid enough enough attention to policy, et cetera. Anyway, or just, you know, if you're just sort of seeing this whole thing with, you know, a day away from Iowa, uh, from New Hampshire, if you're seeing this whole thing in a certain way, I'd love to hear from you. 888-720-WNPR. That's 888-720-9677. A plethora of lines are open right now. Okay. So I also have to thank a few uh, people today. And it's sort of, there's new people to thank. Uh, Not that I don't enjoy thanking the older people who've been here. I don't think of them as the older people anyway. So Bitsy Kaplan is the senior producer of the show. She's the producer of this episode. She's the person who gets uh, these guests. Uh, and so that's great. Uh, Kion Wolf has uh, always been on the board making the show sound great, but we're actually welcoming new talent. They're both in there right now. It's like that moment last night at the Oscars when Captain Marvel and Wonder Woman were both on stage with Sigourney Weaver it, that's the way it's like having Betsy Kaplan and then Cat Pastor and Kion Wolf together. We have a wolf and a cat in the studio, uh, and Cat is going to be uh, running uh, a lot of our technical stuff from now on. Uh, although Kion Wolf is not going far from the show, and you will still hear her voice here, and let there be no panic. All right, so uh, we've got new interns here too, Maxine Filivong and Khalil Rahman, uh, and so welcome to both of them and. The part of Bill Curry uh, was played by Amy Klobuchar. Uh, tomorrow, I think what we're going to do tomorrow, I know I shouldn't sound so <laughs> like I have no real concrete idea. I know what we're going to do tomorrow is we're, we've you know developed this new kind of stealth brand show. It's called Pardon Me, Another Damn Impeachment Show. Obviously, we're running out of time to do that show. But we also feel like you people haven't necessarily, you weekday audience people haven't really found the show and so uh, we're going to run this week's episode again on Tuesday just so you can hear it. Uh, it's got some pretty terrific stuff in it, stuff that is not going to seem particularly dated either, stuff that uh, I think, uh, and including a conversation with Senator Chris Murphy, uh, kind of a, an election postmortem with him, I mean an impeachment postmortem with him, uh, and and et cetera and so forth. All right. So <laughs> I'm just trying to get to the phone calls here. All right. So I put out the call for phone calls. The phone calls have come in. I am going to start with Barbara in, from lovely Darien. Hi, you're on the air. Hi, uh, this is the first time I've ever called a radio station, but I feel so strongly. I signed on to Mike Bloomberg's campaign three days ago at the invitation of an old friend who is a Rockefeller Republican. And I feel so strongly. I am a longtime progressive liberal. Maybe my husband founded Fair Trade. I just feel so strongly that we need to win this this uh, terrible person who's caging children and taking away Social Security and Obamacare has got to, we have to win. And I don't think that Biden can win. He can't even keep a, he can't even organize a campaign in Iowa, which I cried over that because mm-hmm. I really thought he was our answer. 
Um, but I really think we need to win, and I think Mike knows how to win. And, so, uh, he, and I want to win. Yeah. I mean, just very quickly, well, we've got a lot of people calling in. First of all, thanks for this call. This is exactly the kind of call I was sort of hoping slash expecting to get. So is it... Is there a specific reason why you think he knows how to win? In other words, if you're 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 betting it all basically on that idea, what gives you the confidence? Well, you know, if I didn't have it, I signed on. Uh, I guess it's Wednesday morning, and a minute after I signed on, I got a questionnaire about what I thought about a whole bunch of things. I've I've contributed to Biden and Sanders. Never once was I personally asked. For my commitment or what I would do other than money. All right. Frankly. So that's, and, you know, um, I, yeah, that's kind of sets up what Mike was saying, too. S- smart, competent. Uh, uh, there's a way in which uh, he's ready to play the game right now. I'm, I didn't mean to cut you off, but we have uh, a whole bunch of other people on the board and I have almost no time. So I'd like to get a few more voices on the air. Let's start with Howard in Sag Harbor, New York. Hi, you're on the air. Hi, Colin. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I, uh, I don't, I'm not finding a way that I can, su- can support Bloomberg, uh, basically because he remained quiet for so long before getting into the race. And now his ads are just voiceovers. And at the end, he, he says, uh, I'm Michael Bloomberg and I support this message. Well, yeah, tell me about you. I'm not learning anything about the guy. I mean, anybody can put out an ad and, and let somebody else tell your story. He needs to be talking. Right. And presumably there will be longer sit-down interviews. There will be participation in debates. I mean, he, he, he's he been too late to the ball to get on the debate stage. And, and this, as you, I think, are implying, has not even seemed that interested in getting on the debate stage. He's picking his moment. But I don't know. I mean, uh, first of all, is there somebody else that you feel like you couldn't leave or forsake in order to investigate Mike Bloomberg some more? Do you already have a favorite? I, well, uh, I, I feel like nobody's uh, more ready to respond and has a, a question uh, ready to, to, I mean, an answer ready to fire back than, than Pete Buttigieg. It's very hard to fee- see him get caught off guard, and and I respect that. And uh, the fact that he's ready to speak is what, to me, makes makes Bloomberg look bad in comparison. Right. Okay. Well, listen, first of all, thank you so much, Howard, for calling in. Uh, As with all these calls, I mean, uh, it's short notice. I'm very grateful to get them just because I I really do want to kind of hear. We have to do more of this, and we may even do more of this on Wednesday, depending on what my energy levels are like this week. Uh, But, I mean, I almost want to do a call-in show post-New Hampshire. Maybe we'll do that. Uh, For now, though, uh, Robert uh, in Rhode Island, uh, what do you have to say? Hi, Colin. I just want to say quickly that I really am interested in Michael Bloomberg as a potential candidate. I know he's extremely intelligent. He has a great technology savvy. But most importantly, you know, his massive wealth truly emasculates Trump. It (laughs) really, really bothers Trump. But quickly, I would say a, a perfect running mate for a Bloomberg candidacy would be Susan Rice. It would give him the foreign policy chops. It would be someone that would be an entree to the Obama Obama coalition, and I think it would be a very impressive slate to go up against. Right. Well, listen. Thanks for that call. Um, you know, running mates are always interesting. I think people overvalue them. Uh, you know, ultimately, do you feel as though Tim Kaine and Mike Pence had a really big impact on the last election cycle? I mean, do you think Paul Ryan was particularly helpful to Mitt Romney? You know, we, we get so ginned up about these running mates because we have nothing else to get excited about at certain points during a political cycle. But I don't know. You know, it's it's rare. It's rare that they make a difference. Uh, but the caller makes an interesting point that Bloomberg might need somebody with a little bit more of a certain kind of experience. All right. Thanks for listening. Thanks for calling. We're going to do more shows. Just you wait. <laughs>